Uh, welcome to today's webinar, and the topic today is linking empirical data to theoretical modeling. And in this webinar, we are going to discuss the potential ways ahead to facilitate communication and collaboration between uh, empirical people who are working with uh, field data and also data scientists and theoretical and computational scientists. So today we have Dr. Martin Erickson sharing with us. Uh, he got his PhD degree from the Department of Marine Science at the University of Gothenburg, and his thesis focused on exploring the limits to evolution at range margins during theoretical population genetics modeling. And he's presently working as a postdoctoral researcher um, at the Center for Environmental and Climate Science at Lund University within the Strategic Research Environment, Biodiversity and Ecosystem Service in a Changing Climate. And he uses modeling to investigate long-term effects of land use changes on insect pollinators and their mutualistic interactions with agricultural crops. So very interesting topic. So now let's have Martin share with us yeah, how we can link the two fields. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, for the introduction. Uh, let's share the screen then. All right. Yes, when I when I was asked to give this talk, I was a bit worried because it seemed that most previous talks have been about some very exciting um, innovations that are useful already. And in my case, it's really things that could potentially be useful in the future, but there is a crucial link that's missing here. That's from for like, I have a very exciting theoretical model, but we are still kind of missing the link to, to the uh, empirical world. So therefore I thought that maybe I can, we can talk about this, uh, obstacles to this during this presentation uh, and uh, how, uh, yeah, I was already um, introduced so I will not spend so much time on introducing myself but I am a postdoc at Lund University and at the Center for Environmental and Climate Science uh, and within biodiversity and ecosystem service in a changing climate. Uh, and, and yeah, I, I study how uh, pollinated crop interactions are evolving due to land use changes. Uh, and I collaborate with these people. This is Mikkel, who is the PI of, of my project. And also with Mark, who is an economist and is an expert on the on the societal uh, relevance for this project. And Christine Bacon is, is uh, more on the empirical side of this project. And she is from the University of Gothenburg. So I still have some uh, connection to the University of Gothenburg. Um, I will not talk about this now. I will talk more about my, my, my PhD, which was uh, done at the Department of Marine Science with uh, Marina Rafailovic as the main supervisor, but also I had two Q supervisors, Chesney Johansson and Roger Butlin. And I studied the, the limits of adaptation along environmental gradients and, and uh, uh, range margins. So the objective of this talk would first be to present my PhD uh, work and then use this as, an, as hopefully as a motivation to discuss uh, problems for collaboration between empiricists and theoreticians. And, and during the presentation, I will be quite specific and, and focus on, on my, my, my own uh, research. But afterwards, it, I, it would be welcome to have a very general discussion about uh, these things. So my PhD thesis was about uh, yeah, limbs of adaptation along environmental gradients and at range margins. 
and and the, the key uh, result that my entire thesis builds upon is this finding by Jitke Polikov and Nick Barton that range expansion stops when this parameter, the effective environmental gradient that measures uh, how costly it is for for individuals to migrate to a new place in space is relative to this quantity which is uh, depends on, on the neighborhood size that's the number of individuals that uh, that done in, that on, that one individual comes in contact with within an, a generation basically and the strength of selection the average strength of selection per locus um, so yes if, if you knew these parameters these three parameters we could predict where range morgans are expected to occur both on, on a continental scale and also on, on a microhabitat scale such as on, on small islands why 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 do species live in so only in certain areas but not in others and and it would also in principle be possible to know in the future under which conditions population will be viable like how would uh, climate change change the distribution of species and how much like uh, fishing for instance could 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 a fish population sustain before it collapses because uh, when we if if a population is fish too much then the population size will decrease and perhaps eventually the the b would be too high relative to to this and, and the entire population would could potentially collapse so how how much could a population take before and, and still be safe so it would be many potential application of this and it would be fantastic if you just had the right data but unfortunately we as far as i know we don't have this and, and these parameters are not maybe so easy to uh, measure i will go give just one more concrete example this is very very basic science but uh, i like this example um, this is a single species litorhinus exotilis and it exists in two uh, very distinct ecotypes or two morphs what one large uh, ecotype that lives where there's a lot of crabs so it is large to prevent the crabs from breaking the shell and one small that lives where, where there's uh, uh, a lot of waves so it's small and able to cling onto cliffs so it's not washed away by waves and they are live next to each other and uh, can mate with each other and still these two very distinct ecotypes are, are maintained so then we can ask how long can these ecotypes be maintained uh, if we just look at this we can if we measure these parameters for these species we can say that all right if, if b is not uh, larger than, than this quantity then these two ecotypes can be maintained forever basically uh, otherwise this is a transient uh, ecotypes are transient and, and eventually either one of the ecotypes will go extinct so only one uh, persists or potentially uh, two species two different species can form and then, then we would not have the problem that they will make with each other uh, and it is even even if if, if uh, they are transient they can still be uh, maintained for a long time especially if the re recombination rate between the adaptive low say slow as uh, I, I found in, in my first paper during my PhD uh, and, and in fact uh, the it happens that the, the the genes that are important for that are different between these two ecotypes are most of those genes are in regions with low recombination rate that is parts where, where the one part of the chromosome has been inverted and in that case uh, recombination is suppressed so so um, 
then then we can if 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 this is the case then that the, the, the b is larger then, then it's probably because recombinations allow these species to or this this two populations to be persist for a long time and potentially be important for eventual speciation uh, and, and these parameters they are in principle empirically measurable uh, the neighborhood size could be would depend on the neutral genetic diversity and the selection per locus could be estimated from the uh, steepness of the uh, clines in allele frequencies so if, if one allele is uh, favored in one location and, and another one in, in another location if, if there is a very sharp uh, transition from in frequency from one allele to another in space then selection is strong but if, if it's more spread out in space then selection is weaker uh, and the parameter b could be in principle estimated using transplant experiments and I will um, discuss this in, in, in more detail. So, so to, to measure B, we could estimate fitness in, 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 in uh, the foreign environment compared to native environment when an individual is transplanted a typical dispersal distance. But problem is that we, we, how do we accurately estimate fitness? It, it's definitely not uh, an easy thing to estimate and I will uh, use one of my um, my papers to illustrate this so this um, Agutia Baltica lives in, in, in the Baltic Sea at different salinities and, and if we want to know how how tolerant are these to salinity changes how, how will fitness change if, if uh, if one uh, population is moved to a different salinity. So they did, uh, my collaborators, Pierre and Alexandra, did some uh, transplant experiments, transplanting population from high to low salinity. And they found that the population native to high salinity had no difference in, in food consumption and no difference in metabolic rate, which were their uh, proxies for fitness in, in this experiment uh, but they found that the low salinity population had a decreased uh, food consumption in the foreign environment and also an increased metabolic rate but how, how would this uh, relate to fitness quantitatively it's really not uh, obvious to know so, so to estimate fitness, we would need more a more direct estimate than, than metabolic rate, for instance. And also, how do we even know that the, this low salinity has reduced fitness in the foreign environment? Perhaps the increase in metabolic rate is an adaptive response, and that the high salinity population is actually has a reduced fitness in the new environment. Um, so we cannot say how, how fitness changes but we can say that clearly th these two population has some difference in salinity tolerance and this leads us to another uh, problem with measuring b and that's that the different population local populations can have different tolerance and different phenotypic plasticity and, and then, then b would be because plasticity would change the effective environmental gradient it would be different for different populations and moreover plasticity can evolve and therefore b can also evolve so we need to understand what value b eventually evolves to uh, and i did some progress in this in my this paper in philosophical transactions b but this was still for a rather uh, simplified uh, system so for more realistic uh, uh, situations we don't know how b will evolve and therefore b is very difficult to accurately estimate empirically and we would need to we would need both empirical 
work and the theoretical work to be able to uh, make sense of, of this and, and use uh, these uh, uh, expressions to estimate to predict population ranges. So, so in in some, what I want to say is that uh, quantities that quantities that are easy to measure empirically need not agree with quantities that appear in theory and vice versa quantities that, that appear in theory may not be necessarily easy to measure so i think to to um to to link empirical data to modeling we need to from the start agree what quantities are both theoretically interesting and possible to measure uh, and, and collaborate with that but but I, I think that uh, what I want to do with this presentation is to hopefully discuss more with you how how would I, how can we go ahead and, and uh, to facilitate uh, interactions between empiricists and theoreticians. Um, so and and I, I didn't have more to say I think for my presentation. And I, I hope we can open for, for more general discussion, maybe from some of your experience uh, and so on. So...